Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Motorists awaiting outcome of special sitting of Parliament regarding Road Traffic Amendment Validation and Indemnity Act. Discussions underway for increased capacity to provide medical oxygen. And later in sports, West Indies keen to leave T20 World Cup on a winning note against Australia on Saturday. I'm Giovanni Dennis and here are the details. Stakeholders in the transport sector are eagerly awaiting the outcome of a special sitting of Parliament currently underway. Calls are mounting for compensation to motorists that could cost the government billions. Cody and Barrett reports. The spotlight will be on today's special sitting of the House of Representatives as the government seeks to pass a law that could prevent it from paying a multi-billion dollar refund bill to Jamaicans. The sitting is expected to pass a bill entitled the Road Traffic Amendment Validation and Indemnity Act. Vice Chairman of the National Road Safety Council, Dr. Lucian Jones, is looking beyond this bill. Dr. Jones wants the law governing measures to reduce road traffic crashes, which was passed some time ago, to be implemented. I suspect strongly that they are going to make every effort possible to the, um, the new Road Traffic Act. Because we're talking about modern science you know, from a road, road safety perspective. Things like people being mandated to use a cell phone um, with a hands-free instrument is a very key part of the legislation. President of the Jamaica Association of Transport Operators, Jatu, Lewis Barton, agrees that there's a need for a review of the current legislation, but not before taxi operators are fully compensated. We cannot continue to pay for the, the, the failures of what the government or the administration, civil service, mistakes. We already, even though we got a, a, a fear increase the other day, we are still way behind the, 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 the true fear that we're supposed to get. So anything that is, that is taken from us, we want it back. In the meantime, the government is also facing public backlash. Opposition Senator Lambert Brown has signaled he will not be supporting the government's move to shield itself from paying possible refunds on traffic tickets. And so the public have been charged excess of what the law allows for. Now the government has been caught with their pants down. Instead of refunding the people who have been fined the money that the law did not allow them to find them, the government is going to pass a law to cover their wrongdoings, to cover their incompetence. They can't get my support on that. The special sitting was convened speedily following Wednesday's Supreme Court injunction stopping the police from issuing traffic tickets in excess of rates which were charged up to the year 2006. Cody Ann Barrett, TVJ News. And we'll now join Parliament for that special sitting where parliamentarians are looking to pass the Road Traffic Amendment Validation and Indemnity Act. Now opposition leader Mark Golding is on the floor. I think it represents a dereliction on the part of the government in bringing the Road Traffic Act into effect. A lot of work has been done on that act. It didn't start in 2018. The legislation was brought to the House and went through an extensive process of review in the years leading up to that from when we were in government. And for it to have not been brought into effect three years later, we don't know when it will be, is just deplorable. <clears throat> when one looks at the bill itself, Madam Speaker, it, may, it, it purports to amend the third schedule of the Principal Act. But I think that's an error because the third schedule is not where these ticketing fines are contained. The third schedule is created by Section 46 of the Act. The ticketing fines are in an appendix, which is created by Section 116 of the Principal Act. So Clause 2 of the bill is incorrect in seeking to amend the third schedule. It, it wrongly assumes that the appendix is part of the third schedule. It is not. The appendix is created by a completely different section of the Act, Section 116, and not by Section 46, which is where the third schedule is in is created. 
Another issue I have with the bill and doing it this way is that the substantive offenses which are subject to ticketing fines, each of those offenses, each of those offenses is created by a section in the Road Traffic Act, which um, imposes a maximum fine if the matter is dealt with in court, or if the section which creates the offence does not itself impose that fine. Section 108 of the Principal Act has a general penalty of $5,000, which is applicable to any offence under the Act where a fine is not specified. What we're doing here today will enshrine ticketable offences, which are at levels which are substantially higher than the, the maximum fines that can be imposed if the matter were to be dealt with in court. Now, this is not normally how this should work, because the idea of a ticket is to create an incentive to have the matter addressed outside of court without burdening the court system with cases that can be handled through a revenue collection exercise, essentially, which is what a ticketing system is. This approach means that everybody who gets a ticket now will have an incentive not to pay it, but to go to court instead and either plead guilty and pay the maximum fine there, which is lower than the ticket, or if they feel they have a defense, plead not guilty and fight the case in court. It would be wise, I think, if we are going to amend the act an act which we're about to repeal, indeed, which has been repealed by the 2018 Act, but that act is not yet in effect, so the, appeal hasn't the repeal has not yet taken effect. If we're going to be amending an act which is already the subject of legislation which has repealed it, then we should do it in a way that doesn't create a perverse incentive. And a perverse incentive is created by having the ticketing fines higher than the substantive fines in the sections which create the offenses and which incentivize persons to go to court and, and pay their fines there through a court process which involves pleading and either pleading guilty and paying the fine or pleading not guilty and fighting the case and it goes to trial and uses up court time because the levels of the fines if they, in the tickets are substantially higher than the maximum fines that can be imposed by the court mm -hmm. if the matter goes to court. So, Madam Speaker. And that's a special sitting of Parliament where the opposition leader Mark Golding was, well, is still speaking. Now they are discussing the Road Traffic Amendment Validation and Indemnity Act, Act rather, where the government is looking to shield itself uh, from paying billions in refunds to motorists who were charged tickets in excess of the rates that were allowed. We'll now take a break here on the Midday News, but please stay with us. We'll have much more when we return. Welcome back. We're continuing the news. There's increased concern that despite the death toll from COVID-19, Manchester residents are still taking the pandemic too lightly. Speaking at a memorial service for those who died from the virus in Manchester, Director of the Southern Regional Health Authority and the Costas both urged residents to do more to protect themselves. Krista Campbell reports. A memorial in Manchester for COVID casualties. A pandemic that's changed life and death, with many of the victims dying alone in a hospital and some of those mourning them unable to say their final farewell because of COVID restrictions. Over 10% of the overall deaths are from Manchester, but local authorities are still concerned that residents are not taking the virus seriously enough. The Costas is urging them to get COVID facts from authorized sources and not take the island-wide vaccination drive for granted. So far, we have 2,234 COVID-19 deaths versus zero COVID-19 vaccination deaths. Get protected. Over 2,000 persons dying, and in Manchester, 200 and odd. That's a lot, and we can prevent many of these. So we're asking persons to, first of all, get vaccinated, and also to continue to follow the protocols. As COVID hospitalizations continue to decline in the Southern Regional Health Authority, Director Michael Bent says health authorities are partnering with more agencies to set up vaccination sites and to help encourage residents to take the jab. Over 185,000 doses throughout the region, 
in Manchester, I know they would have done over 60, over 60,000 um, doses, but we still need to get more persons vaccinated. Our target is to get 65% um, of the 600,000 residents in the parishes of Clarendon, Manchester and St. Elizabeth vaccinated. Krista Campbell, TVJ News. And sticking with COVID, 15 more people have died from the respiratory illness in Jamaica. The death toll now stands at 2,272. Meanwhile, the country's positivity rate has decreased to 11.5%, down from Wednesday's 18.3%. 117 new confirmed cases were reported in the last 24 hours from 1,417 test samples. The overall case count is now 89,466. 243 people are hospitalized with the virus. 18 are in critical condition, while 27 are severely ill. There are 27,856 active cases on the island. In the meantime, 146 more people have recovered from COVID-19, increasing the overall recovery count to 58,722. With Jamaicans bracing for a possible fourth wave of the coronavirus, Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton says discussions are underway for increased capacity for medical oxygen. Dr. Tufton says steps will be taken to meet the demand should the need arise. We have had and have been having discussions with the sole supplier to see what the capacities are and we'll take a similar approach in terms of forecasting and projecting to see what a possible fourth wave would look like and what the demand would be so that hopefully they can secure future supplies in anticipation of that possibility. There have been some other initiatives around bringing in some of the more portable type devices for supporting any excess capacity that is required. So yes, it is a part of the framing of the discussion and part of the plan. The private sector organization of Jamaica, PSOJ, is calling for the decentralization of COVID-19 testing to improve access and reduce cost. In a statement, the PSOJ said that the cost of COVID-19 testing is too expensive and is therefore appealing to the government to look into more rapid antigen testing options, including home or self-testing kits. It's also calling for an expansion of the number of places approved for testing, as well as an increase in the number of doctors doing antigen testing. And the police have cordoned off the intersection of Lindhurst Road and Beechwood Avenue after the body of a man was discovered early this morning. The man, who has not yet been identified, was found with wounds to his head. Business owners in the area told our news centre that the man is known in the area. The police are still combing through the scene. No motorists are, are being advised to use alternative routes. Now we'll have more on this story in subsequent newscasts. To other news, the Education Ministry says no effort will be spared in improving the educational levels of the population. It comes after years of complaints from educators on the performance of Jamaican students on external exams. O'Shane Masters has more. Students will now have to spend an extra two years in school at the secondary level. But Education Minister Fable Williams says parents need not worry as they will not have a big burden to carry. This is an investment that the government is making in our students. It's an investment because we know that if we don't, the costs are greater. Um, I know parents are concerned uh, and, I, you know, Dr. Troop, you have all the details, right? Dr. Troop, you can <laughs> guide the parents. Yes. Um, but parents, we're asking you to come along with us as well. Um, the government will be responsible for the majority of it, but parents, um, we know that uh, an investment is going to be needed from you in terms of your support, in terms of some other um, maybe minor things, uh, but we're asking you to travel with us on this road as well in the interest of your child. Speaking at a virtual town hall on the country's Sixth Form Pathways program, Ms. Williams says it is important as it will redound to the benefit of the island. Currently, 19% of the student population is enrolled in tertiary education, while 15% of the workforce is tertiary level qualified. 
the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information's proposal to streamline secondary education and training by way of an additional two years at the secondary level is one that has been subjected to meaningful consideration. The key objectives are to better enable students to achieve their full potential regardless of the secondary school they attend, create multiple pathways for bet that better facilitate students in attaining the skills, competences, and certification needed to pursue higher education or to enter the world of work. We also want to increase the certific certification rates of students. Educators over the years have bemoaned the poor performance of Jamaican students, especially in external exams. But with this move, technocrats in the education ministry say there are more gains for students. This puts them at a better place, a better position, should they wish to pursue further studies um, in, in, at the tertiary level. But it also means that for those who may have to, for whatever reason, transition from secondary education into the workforce, it creates a better platform for that movement. When completed, students will be able to receive associate degrees, City and Guild certification, CAPE certification or CAPE associate degree or competency certification from the National Vocational Qualification Jamaica. Minister Williams says all public secondary schools 24 private institutions and 10 public tertiary institutions will be involved in the program. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. It's now time for the Business Minute with Cody and Barrett. In the world of business, the National Commercial Bank is now offering financing to customers to acquire electric vehicles EVs. According to the head of retail banking and customer experience, Cherie Martin, the commercial bank saw it important to step in early with its loan facility Drive Green, Drive Clean to meet the needs of consumers interested in owning the increasingly popular battery-powered vehicles. The current loan product is exclusively for clients who will utilize the vehicles for private use. And in business internationally, shares of drug giant Pfizer surged more than 10% in early trading Friday after the company announced positive test results for an experimental pill it has developed to fight COVID-19. Pfizer said the pill reduced the risk of hospitalization and death for high-risk patients who were part of a trial taking the drug. The news comes just a few days after Pfizer reported strong earnings and sales, thanks largely to the success of the COVID-19 vaccine it developed with BioNTech. And that's it for the Business Minute this week. I'm Cody Ann Barrett. We go now to O'Shane Masters with the top regional and international stories. The Caribbean Drought and Precipitation Monitoring Network on Friday said while there are no concerns over short-term drought in the region, long-term drought can manifest across some areas in the Caribbean in the coming months. The Precipitation Monitoring Network said that this is particularly so in the vicinity of Dominica and southeastern portions of Belize. In its latest bulletin, the network has recommended that the Windward and Leeward Islands, Western Cuba, Northern Bahamas and Southern Belize closely monitor their water resources. The United Nations says the world isn't doing enough to navigate the climate crisis. It says the increased droughts, floods, wildfires and heat waves that have already been seen are likely here to stay. The UN Environment Programme's Adaptation Gap Report says those issues are impacting low-income countries five to ten times faster than money is flowing into them. The report comes as world leaders met at the COP26 Climate Summit in Scotland. And two people were killed in a gunfight near a hotel in the Cancun area, Mexico, on Thursday. The authorities said there was a confrontation between members of hostile groups of drug dealers on a beach in Puerto Morelos. The prosecutor said there are no other reports of serious injuries. And that's it for the top regional and international stories. I'm Ashane Masters. And we now head to a quick break. When we come back, Simon Preston will have the Midday Sports. Welcome back. It's now time for Midday Sports. I'm Simon Preston. West Indies batsman Sharon Hetmeyer says the Caribbean side are keen to end their participation in the ICC T20 World Cup on a winning note as they face Australia in Abu Dhabi on Saturday. The 24-year-old says with another T20 World Cup next year, the Windies will be looking to rotate the strike better.
I think it's for mo- for most teams that play T20s, right? Try to try to limit the dot ball percentage. I think that's something that we've been working on from the Caribbean with those 15 T20 games that we had, and even now we're still working on just basically parting as as less dot balls as we possibly can because everyone knows West Indies teams are boundary hitting teams. So if we could, if if we could basically mix boundary hitting with getting singles and dub- and doubles and stuff. In between that, it's something that will really benefit us. Thursday's 20-run defeat to Sri Lanka meant the West Indies will not be in the semi-finals of the T20 World Cup for the first time since 2010. Now, the Jamaica Olympic Association held their groundbreaking ceremony under the theme The Next Generation on Thursday. President of the JOA, Christopher Simoda, says the new hub for the umbrella sporting body on the island will be used to monetize their assets. Olympic Manor will house, of course, conference facilities. It will house executive offices. It will house a gym and wellness centre. It will house a chancery in which we will inaugurate the Olympic order. It will also have a chapel in which, of course, we will continue to pray for inspiration and insight and foresight. It will also house, of course, a talk shop. It will house, of course, um, a retail shop where Olympic paraphernalia, Olympic goods will be sold and a special line created. So in all, it would be a multi-purpose building. It will be an earning asset. Samuda says the new headquarters will also serve as a hub for all sporting associations on the island. It will be a house where all our member associations will come, will discuss sport, will have conversations on sport, will vision the development of sport with us, And we know that after that dialogue and after those conversations, sport must and shall be the winner. The overall cost of the project is 120 million Jamaican dollars and it will be financed through a partnership between the JOA and the Pan American sports organization PASO. PASO will provide 60 million dollars and the JOA will foot the rest of the bill. To football we go now as reggae boy Leon Bailey and Aston Villa will travel to the English South Coast to face Southampton in the lone game in the English Premier League at St Mary's this afternoon. Villa are 15th in the table on 10 points, while Southampton are 14th on 11 points. Kickoff is at 3 o'clock Jamaica time. EPL action continues on Saturday with a slate of five fixtures. And that is where we blow the final whistle for now. For your midday sports report, I'm Simon Preston. Giovanni, it is over to you. Simon, we're next for the West Indies after a disappointing run in this World Cup. Well, they have a test series against Sri Lanka to come, but after that they will have a limited overs tour of Pakistan, the first time since 2006 on an ODI setup. But as you know, the likes of Chris Gale, Dwayne Bravo, that could have been their last tournaments for the Caribbean side. So we'll have to look at some younger players to come up through the ranks. Chance for the team to redeem itself in next year's T20 World Cup, you think? There's a chance, but you would have to say their approach would have to change moving from being that boundary hitting team, perhaps to have a bit more balance to rotate the strike, as Sherman Hitmeyer said earlier. Indeed. Well, that's it for the midday news. I'm Giovanni Dennis. Join us at 7 for primetime news. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, have a good afternoon. <laughs>